So today we're going to talk about um, the evolution, uh, principles of evolution as they relate to plants. We've talked about a few things, genetics and speciation, or speciation with polyploidy and other things, and some of these things will be inherent into this lecture as well. So evolution, the history really starts with the theory of natural selection, which was pr proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace in 1859, um, which is that organisms with adaptations favorable to their environment will survive and reproduce more so than organisms that are less favorable favorable okay and so this is the concept then of organic evolution or the evolution of living things where you have a change in a genetic structure or representation of genes over time in organisms um, as it applies to populations right so this isn't talking about individuals individuals don't um, evolve they may change but evolution happens over generations okay so there are some things which point to this theory including artificial selection so um, natural selection is the same except rather than the environment being you know the abiotic and biotic fa factors in the environment the environment is then the humans themselves so we can kind of pick and choose which um, characteristics we like and then make sure that only those characteristics are represented in the next population through selection um, and in agriculture this has happened many many times again by selecting for parts of the plant which are going to produce things which are good for eating so an example is a common wild mustard brassica oleracea is can be selected has been selected for many different traits all of which have been used for different um, edible foods so the leaves can be were selected for kale um, the sprouts and um, stems and flowers for broccoli and other stems kohlrabi you know all this can produce many different um, types of th these are all the same plant but they are they're selected for different traits um, another example includes insect populations which are evolving resistance to insecticides. Um, so you, you spray these insecticides on the plants and it kills most of them. Some of them survive. Those that survive um, reproduce abundantly and then those can then um, resist the pesticides. So evolutionary biologists determine the fate of transgenes after planting genetically engineered crops. And we talked about this with Monsanto and their steps for genetically engineering organisms. Transgenes then are foreign genes introduced to plants through genetic engineering. Um, and sometimes those genes can then um, be found as they interbreed or are um, one way or another get into other types of plants and those can create then weed resi herbicide resistant weeds um, because they have those same genes so evolution was first uh, proposed by charles darwin in his um, essay um, but it had a lot of resistance at first um, until uh, the 1930s so you had a second revolution where Mendelian genetics then gave a um, you know a method of inheritance you now have these genes things that can be inherited which would provide the mechanism for selection for or against certain traits uh, we're now living in the third revolution where we have a development so genes that control the development of organisms um, and the evolution of them are very important for you know human and other animal development and so homeobox genes are these set of genes and you can trace them in humans and in flies which um, when controlled and manipulated or uh, can can provide uh, different development stages um, or code for different developmental stages within an organism so the same genes which um, make a fly uh, know which you know the development of a head and a tail and wings are also uh, important for the development of different parts of the human um, and organisms with nearly identical genomes can look very different because of different developmental programs created by them so the genes may be the same but the things um, causing their development the homeobox genes which are controlling them 
um, can be different. All right, so Charles Darwin, he some influences which helped him in his uh, formulation of this hypothesis. First one was he was a naturalist upon a um, a vessel called the HMS Beagle, which went around the world, made, made many stops, and he made a lot of observations while doing that. He also read a book by Charles Lyell on geology, which had this principle of gradualism, basically that the Earth is is much older than 6,000 years, so there's lots of time, time needed for evolution to take place. Uh, and then he made a lot of collections and observations about plants and animals and their patterns and, and, and notice, started to notice um, things which pointed to evolution. And then also read an eth essay by an economist named Malthus on overpopulation, who noticed that lots of humans are born, but not all of them survive. So there's some factor which limits the survival of others, and others survive, so similar to evolution. Um, Alfred Wallace also kind of was a world traveler, did a lot of um, similar things to Darwin, and also noticed these same patterns. And so when he also developed uh, independently the theory of evolution, he contacted Darwin and they produced and um, published a paper on it together. So there's lots of evidence for evolution. It's the best theory we have in biology um, for the explanation of, of where organisms came from. Um, one of the evidences is we have convergent evolution. So we have species which are unrelated, um, which are developing the same function under the same conditions. So a desert in New Mexico and a desert in Africa produce organisms which look similar even though they aren't related. So an example of this is the cactus and euphorbia, both adapted to arid habitats, but they are unrelated. We also have structural and relationships of proteins, DNA, and other molecules in common use of ATP. So there's lots of enzymes which are commonly used throughout all different types of organisms, including cytochrome C oxidase, which is required for um, the use of energy. It's universal in all living organisms. They all have it. It's all the same. Um, the fossil record also, so you can look, you see we have a fossil fern here, and then the evolution of whales here. You can see from, you know, intermediates from one life form to another. And the dating of these fossils is millions and millions of years old. Um, also the geographic geographical distribution of organisms, and this is things that, something that both Wallace and Darwin um, discovered or noticed as they were traveling around the world, is... Um, Organisms are adapted to different places, and you find different organisms in different areas. So, for example, in Australia, you find marsupials and all these animals, which are much different, but um, fill similar niches as mammals in other places. So, there are evolution can be split into two different types. Microevolution is changes in um, in in genes and in microsome uh, sorry chromosomes, which lead to small changes um, from one generation to the next. So you can have a mutation in a gene, mutation in a chromosome, um, and some of them may include a deletion where a piece of the chromosome is, is missing, the genes are no longer there. You can have a translocation where a piece it breaks off and, and goes somewhere else. Um, or you can have an inversion where is a translocation and one is flipped upside down. and you can have one or more nucleotide pairs changed. Uh, you can have those deleted or also inverted, and, and you can have an addition as well. So most mutations are harmful, which lead into uh, the, uh, the death of whatever was developing. But some of them can produce characteristics which are helpful, and those might help then an organism better represent their genes in the next generation or survive and reproduce. Um, so uh, migration is um, so it's something that can cause changes in genes within a population include migration where you have um, genetic flow between different populations, immigration and emigration, and this all depends on the size of the population and their isolationism. 
if they're isolated, then they are subject to having a, a different um, set of genes than the other populations. And this is called genetic drift. Um, and this is basically just by chance if you take a small subsample of a population, it's not going to have the same genes represented as the larger population. Macroevolution then is looking at changes in species over large periods of time, including how species are formed or speciation. So one of the ways they form is through geographic isolation, and this is called allopatric speciation. Um, you may have a river or mountain between two populations, um, and that separation decreases gene flow, and then um, the differences in these population uh, environments will select for different species. Um, random mu mutations can also spread throughout the different populations but not among them and then eventually it will be to the point where they can no longer um, have mating or um, gene flow between them. Ecological isolation is where Smaller things such as climate or soils may play a role in isolation or mutations, and species are are formed even though they inhabit the same areas. Okay, and usually occurs to the point where you know for whatever whatever differences they eventually become so great that they no longer can again exchange genes in the different populations. Some of these that may occur include mechanical isolation where um, just the pollen doesn't fit into specific uh, different types of species. Other isolating mechanisms may be sperm or me chemically or mechanically prevented from reaching the egg. Um, and there may be things also which are post-psychotic, so after fertilization occurs. Uh, you may have a failure of embryos, embryos to develop or hybrids often can't survive or breed, or even if they can survive. So the hybrids may not have a normal pair pairing during meiosis, so resulting in a sterile hybrid. Hybridization, which we talked about last, last time, is where um, you know two different species can form a, a, a new offspring. Whether or not that offspring is viable or not depends on uh, one thing, including the many things, including the number of chromosomes. Um, but they may have gene combinations which are better suited through this hy hybrid. And so two related species may also hybridize. hybridize. Intergression is the intercrossing between hybrids and their parents. So maybe that cross may work and that may create a new species as well. Now, one of the things that can occur with hybridization is polyploidy. And we talked about that with wheat, that if you have this hybridization, it can create these species um, which are infertile. But if you have a hybridization event and a polyploidy event, that makes them better able to reproduce. Okay, and it's thought that more than half of flowering plant species originated this way through some hybridization and polyploidy event. All right, the last thing we'll talk about is um, some sterile hybrids may just reproduce asexually since a lot of plants do that. Not a lot of animals can do that, but plants can. Apomixis then is the process, uh, or yeah, is the production of seeds without fertilization, and dandelions do this. These um, the seed-like or uh, seed-like structures which create the you know the dandelions which you blow are actually just um, asexual um, or can be just clones of the the individual and can go and then propagate a new plant. They can also occur, uh, they can also reproduce through sexual reproduction as well. So this makes them very good at colonizing areas and why it's such a good weedy species um, because it can reproduce either or asexual or sexually. Alright, that's it from evolution.